recent years, as we have been actively engaging in war, things the government used to do is now being done by private companies. Food, laundry, and housing were services provided within the military. Now we're in Iraq, you still need a lot of support mechanisms, and there's just not enough military infrastructure to do this. Private contractors come in and they fill the gap. Well, I saw contractors in Iraq doing anywhere from helping fix tanks, helicopter mechanics, pretty much any job that's in the military, there's a civilian contractor right there. There are over 100,000 private contractors working in Iraq, Kuwait, and the surrounding area. This war has been privatized to a greater extent than any other war in history. They're part of a multi-billion dollar industry fueled by your tax dollars, an industry very much in need by the U.S. military. 40 cents out of every dollar Congress controlled now goes to contractors. There's more than 20,000 private military on the ground. They're the second largest armed force in Iraq are private security. They outscale the Brits or any other nation. Blackwater is one of the largest and most conspicuous security firms in Iraq with about 300 employees there. Blackwater is staffed largely by retired U.S. military, including former members of the Special Forces. Scotty was told that he would be doing security for Paul Bremer, the ambassador. That he would just go everywhere Paul Bremer went, and there would be uh, usually like three eight-hour shifts. And that was fine with Scotty, because he didn't go over there to hurt anyone. He was there to, to protect people. Watch out now. I don't want you to get underneath me when I'm climbing. You might get hurt. Hey, Kelsey. He just had an incredible way with sports. Even as a small child, he was the best swimmer on the swim team. He was amazing. First time he ran away from home, I think he was six months old, and somehow he'd gotten the front door open and he was in his walker. And I'm getting ready for work and he's hauling tail down this hill, heading for the playground. And it just totally stunned me. And he, he was like that for the rest of his life. He was always running. Scotty went into the Navy on his 17th birthday. He loved being a SEAL. Oh, what's this falling down? As far as Scotty going to Iraq, he chose Blackwater because they had a two-month contract. And uh, Scotty wasn't going to have to be away from his kids very long. He needed to make some money. My son called me. And he told me that he was going to Kuwait with Paul Brumer, the ambassador in Iraq. I still have little soldiers in a shoebox that he used to play with. Those that were his favorite toys. A lot of boys. What? This is Jerry and this time. Oh. That's my favorite picture for all of them. I'm talking, that's... And Jerry I'm always four, carried five. it with him, always. Well, well, Wherever Jerry went, he had a pic that picture with him. That was my Jerry. Then came my Tommy, then my niece Anita, then my nephew Yuri. Yes, everything is my Lydia. Tommy and my Jerry. I love that. Well, he was, uh, you know, he was the firstborn. Uh, everything I knew about kids I learned with him, you know, and for him. The news came out on the radio and uh, it said that there was an incident in Fallujah. Breaking news story tonight. The four American civilians were ambushed and killed in Fallujah, and they're believed to be from a local company called Blackwater Security Counseling. There are four families uh, in this world today that are going to get knocks on the doors, and you don't want to be on either side of that door when that happens, either hearing the news or delivering the news. Reality didn't check in. I didn't want it to believe it. I still don't want to believe it, but the fact is he's not walking the earth. I need to pray for his soul. I, um, I, I miss him. I was so angry. I was so unbelievably angry. And I didn't even know what had happened. But I was just angry that my son had died. The people that did this horrible thing, these Iraqi insurgents, or maybe they were just kids on the street, 
they were taught hatred for anyone that didn't represent what they had been taught to believe in. And I found it so hard to hate them. But when I found out what Blackwater did, that's when I started really feeling real. I, I, I don't know how to say it. The vehicles should have been armored and they also should have had saws, which are heavy belt-fed machine guns in each vehicle, which they didn't have. There were supposed to be three individuals in each car. They pulled off two guys to do, from what I was told, clerical work. So they sent them out short two men. Their contracts list that they were to know where they're going and they were to know people that they're working with. And have been there before. And have been there there before. So they, if, if they had had an armored vehicle, if they had had the rear gunman, he was the one that was going to protect them. My son is now walking the earth because people that he trusted and worked for did not care about him. It was the mighty dollar. That's all that they cared about. They know, knowingly skimped on the mission. They cut corners left and right. Shameful country, shameful black father, shameful rule, black father. What happened to them while they were with this company, company, not the American military, this company, had responsibilities that they didn't live up to. And our family members died because of that. The most dangerous city on earth. No rear gunner, no armored vehicles, not even a map. That's to me negligent homicide. They were just numbers for them. Just people who they can bill for. <laughs> this is a situation that was in the front page of the news that was leading various network broadcasts for several days. And how that company manages that challenge will really dictate the future of that company. The first thing, the first focus has to be for any company that finds itself in, a, in the type of crisis that Blackwater found itself in is, what do we need to do to preserve the financial business future of this company? This is a company whose success, economic success, is completely contingent upon funding from the U.S. government. Within the first 24 hours, Blackwater had hired a D.C. lobbying firm called Alexander Strategies Group. ASG is one of those small handful of firms in 2004 uh, that was part of the Republican Conservative Club. Blackwater itself, in particular its CEO and founder, Eric Prince, has long-standing ties to the conservative movement, particularly on the uh, Christian coalition side, had been very generous with his campaign contributions over the years. He and his family contributed over two million dollars to Republican candidates and the Republican Party. Hey guys, I really don't want to talk to you, okay? Thank you. I want to ask you some questions about your men with Fallujah. What happened there, sir? Fallujah happens the last day of March. Within 24 or 48 hours after that, they're literally on the hill meeting with some of the most powerful members of Congress who really were going to dictate what was going to happen to this company in terms of its funding. They went to John Warner who was the uh, chair of the Armed Services Committee on the Senate side. They went to Duncan Hunter, 
who is a congressman from San Diego, who is the chair of the Armed Services Committee on the House side. They met with Rick Santorum, who is chair of the Republican Senate Conference Committee, which is a very, very powerful post. Contractors are among those who have been taken hostage. They've also suffered terribly, injuries and loss of life, the most terrific of which occurred on April 13th of this year, Madam President, when the bodies of four contractors were burned, mutilated, and hung from a bridge in Iraq. Should we step up and try and do something about that problem? Uh, we will have to have very vigorous opposition to this amendment as it is presently drawn. The Blackwater strategy worked very, very well. They went to Washington, they stopped any investigation from taking place, and at the end of the day, as a result of their action, they were able to protect their business. They went out and they retained former high-ranking uh, government official, Kofor Black, who was a high-ranking official at the Central Intelligence Agency, Joseph Schmidt, who was the Inspector General at the Pentagon. And undoubtedly, when you go out and you retain high-ranking officials like that, they certainly are helpful in attracting new business, pursuing new business, uh, and getting new contracts. Within a year after the Fallujah incident, they had received over $200 million in new government contracts. People in Washington who leave government and go to work in lucrative jobs with defense industry, they have connections. They have influence. Business boomed. They just built a brand new headquarters. That's a big expansion. It's a, it's a rather big expansion, but it's needed. Uh, certainly we've left room for growth. Right, 8,000 square feet in the original building, 64,000 square feet here. The company says it can assemble hundreds of battle-ready men, a small private army at a moment's notice. Teams of Blackwater independent contractors are deployed around the world. Instead of mourning my son's death and the other three men, they go and they profiteer off of it. They were cutting every possible corner to make more money for them. In Iraq, most of the men aren't getting the protection. Men over there working for Blackwater are still dying. The world really needs to know what's going on over there, and we need to stop it. There has to be accountability. Right now, they are literally getting away with murder. Companies should not be permitted to operate in a war zone and not be held accountable. I was reading the Bible in Greek and Hebrew and studying those languages, and Hebrew sort of led naturally into Arabic. I was also interested in student loan repayment. I, I owed, a, you know, upwards of $40,000 in student loans, which the Army promised to repay. The option available to me was to get a secret clearance and become an interrogator, and I agreed that this was pre-9-11. I didn't really expect I'd have to interrogate someone, or imagined if I did, it would have been in a conventional war uh, where things would have been very different. I found out um, in April of 2003 uh, by a phone call. He said, well, the good news is, congratulations, you've been selected for promotion to Brigadier General. So I said, well, that's good news. What, what could possibly be the bad news? And he said, well, the bad news is your unit, uh, you'll be commanding is assisting the prisons experts with the restoration of prisons for all of Iraq. Um, and they're already deployed. And I said, well, can I go? And there was just a second of silence on the other end of the telephone, and he said, you want to go? I received a telephone call um, from a Mr. Saleh. He said, uh, can you help me? He said, the Americans took my money, and they hurt me very bad. 
um, and I just came from Abu Ghraib. He told me of one incident where, um, uh, you know, he was uh, stripped nude, and um, they tied a rope to his penis for, uh, with seven or eight other men, and then they would, um, these were American personnel, he's telling me, um, and they would push one man, and all of them would fall, and, and, and they'd be joking and laughing and mocking him. I would ask him, who was doing this to you, Mr. Saleh? And he would say, well, they were, they were two types of people. One was dressed some type of military personnel wearing the army. And then the other type would be in civilian clothing. I go, what do you mean civilian clothing? He goes, like normal pants, like uh, any normal pants and a normal shirt. So that's the first time when it struck me that there's another element being involved here in Abu Ghraib, another type of person there. كان يوم أحد يوم الثنين كانت حالة من الفوضى ومن الإجراءات الأمنية الشديدة يوم الثلاثاء اللي هو يوم اعتقالي ذهبت إلى عملي مو عملي أنا يعني كنا في موقع عمل في منطقة الحصوة فأني أعمل في مجال الكهرباء تم نقلي إلى سجن أبو غريب في بداية عام 2004 باليوم الأول من الشهر الأول لعام 2004 كان أكو شخص مدني واقف بيت أمر يعني يأخذون أوامرهم من عنده اللي هم الشركات الأمنية أدخلوني إلى الزنزانة كبلوني وتم خلع ملابسي بالقوة يعني أسلوب من أساليبهم أنه العضو التناسلي للرجل يلفون عليه حبل ويجروه هيك مثل عملية الخنق شنو الغاية من عندها شنو هاي العبرة الضربون إياها اللي آني هسا حاليا حتى أطفال مدى يصيرون عندي شنو الداعي لأنه جيش يستعين بشركات أمنية مدنية للتحقيق مع معتقلين بس أنا أقول لك هاي الشركتين مؤكدة شركة تايتن وشركة أي سي أي سي أي When I saw the photographs for the first time and I said to the commander of the criminal investigation division who was showing them to me um, I said why are the translators around the prisoners. Why, why are the translators in the cell block? And he said, ma'am, those aren't translators. Those are khaki interrogators. Khaki was hired by the Department of Interior out of a little town in Arizona called Sierra Vista. And they were hired to do database work. And that contract, which was sort of a blanket contract that allowed them to do a whole bunch of different things, was used to do interrogation in Abu Ghraib. So what ostensibly was a contract to do clerical work or IT work turned out to be getting information not from a computer but from human beings in uh, a notorious prison in Iraq. At the time of the scandals in the spring of 2004, roughly 50% of the interrogators were private contractors. This amendment, uh, Madam President, attempts to address what I believe is a very legitimate and serious concern that have come to light in recent uh, days with respect to the use of or misuse of contractors in the treatment of detainees in, in Iraq. Quite simply, Madam President, uh, this amendment would prohibit the use of contractors in interrogations of prisoners and in offensive military operations. It just seems to me abundantly clear that we cannot hire private contractors to perform a function as gov inherently governmental, inherently sensitive, indeed inherently explosive, and for which there must be accountability, as is the interrogation of prisoners. Corporations exist to make a profit, and in, when they are hired to do uh, jobs, whether it's the provision of water or the you know, interrogation of prisoners, their job is to get as much work as possible and make as much profit as possible. Now that doesn't work in the field of intelligence, period. You do not put personnel who do not have allegiance and 100% loyalty to uh, um, um, America, um, you do not put them in sensitive um, key government um, activities like military intelligence gathering. It creates a conflict too because we were uncertain, you know, we knew what our chain of command was, that was very clear and we were forced to memorize it and follow it, but what's the khaki chain of command? بفضل هاي الشركة هاي السجون أصبحت معسكرات التدريب على الأرض 
وفوجئت بالاحتقار نفسه وبالفعل بعد يوم يومين نقلت الى سجن ابو ريس ورفع الكيس من راسي وانجزت نفسي امام مجموعه عسكر مجندين و يعني من دول المحققين عرفنا فيما بعد مجموعه حوالي ثمانيه او عشره يطولون علي و يضعون البندقيه باماكن حساسه بالجسم وبالاضافه الى الضرب وكنت اسمع به استغاثات استغاثات ناس ناس تستغيث من تعذيب او من ضرب ونباح كلاب There was a wink and a nod approach. We have these rules, you're going to follow them, but we're not going to spend that much time making sure that you're going to follow them. And if I don't know about what's going on, then I can, um, you know, have plausible deniability. The contractor is safely in an office in the United States somewhere. So no direct supervision. And to just simply say, well, I guess they got out of control. I don't know what, where they were taking their instructions from. It seems to excuse all of them. I have reproduced an excerpt from the job posting as it was reprinted in the Washington Post on May 10th on the poster here behind me. And let me read it for you. It says, under minimal supervision will assist and goes on. Key words, under minimal supervision. In 2003, the Pentagon essentially panicked, and a very desperate Secretary of Defense did whatever he had to do very, very quickly to try to get more intelligence. If that meant running out and hiring a bunch of contractors who didn't know what they were doing and putting them wrongly into the chain of command of military intelligence, that's what they did. They were desperate. The contracting business in Iraq is very, very lucrative. There was so much money being given away over there to contractors. I mean, there were, there were jobs that didn't even need to be there. Uh, you know, we'd go into the tent to use our, our internet, and the woman who would put my name down to assign me to a computer would be a civilian contractor who was making six figures to be over there. But why is she there? Why are we paying this woman to do this? They threw so much money at these people they can't refuse. I mean, if you're a mechanic, you're making like twenty or thirty thousand. Someone offers you a hundred thousand a year tax-free to go to Iraq, and that's that's hard. I think that's really hard to refuse. They would very often sit down with soldiers, particularly from Reserve or National Guard, and say, "Hey, man, you know, what are you making? Three thousand dollars a month over here?" You know, I make that in a week. You would talk about how, you know, in, in eight more months, I'm going to be out of here and I'm going to be making 140 grand. It certainly affected retention because I don't know, I don't know why any, any military person would re-enlist to do the same job when they could get out of the military and make, you know, six times their money and, uh, and do the same job. There was a, uh, uh, a little uh, phrase that we threw around um, food for freedom, that if, if you wanted to get paid more, you should start eating more so that you'd get booted out for being overweight. And um, it's an honorable discharge, and it would, it would boost your, uh, your pay, you know, your net worth by about five times um, if you were to do such a thing. And, um, and it worked. جوا علينا الامريكان بال11 ونص بالليل واخذوني انا وابني فابني جاي يقول لهم يقول لهم هذه امي فاجى الامريكي جابني من ايدي حق قال لي جو جو هيك حيل صح فقال لي اعترفي اذا ما تعترفين على الارهابيين وياك راح اوديك بمكان يعتدون عليك ويلعبون بيك طوبه الامريكي راح سلك اسد انت وابني Uh, 
I was getting really angry. I mean, especially because I knew that a lot of these prisoners that I saw uh, with these injuries from from abuse and torture really hadn't done anything. They weren't part of the insurgency. They were just picked up for no reason at all. We were interrogating taxi drivers and you know, like pizza delivery guys. Um, it was just, you know, we called them average Ahmed. Using methods such as torture and also using people who are not qualified to do this job has resulted in bad information and therefore uh, problems for national security and for the soldiers because you're you're getting information that's no good. In a lot of areas where you start noticing a lot of, you know, a, a lot of hostility against American soldiers, it's not because the soldiers are doing a lot of wrong things. It's because sometimes maybe the communicating that has been transmitted to them has been transmitted to them wrongly and professionally and serving someone else's interest. These are Titan linguists. They were hired by Titan. <laughs> Titan has long-standing contracts providing critical information technology and support services for some of our nation's most valuable defense assets. Under a contract with the U.S. Army's Intelligence and Security Command, Titan has over 4,000 linguists that provide invaluable mission-critical services. Titan is the company that provides the linguists and continues to provide the linguists throughout Iraq. They're the biggest provider in this business. They were so desperate to get people to fill these positions as translators that they were just hiring anybody that uh, approached somebody and obviously had command of the English language in addition to the Arabic language or Farsi or whatever it may have been. There was people who maybe spoke the language but it was broken but could not read it or write it. And I'm talking about English here. And they were hired. They were never given a test. Nobody was given a test. I was never given a test. The test I was given was a phone conversation for a minute military trusted us, military trusted Titan. Titan came and said, here's a linguist that we have hired, we have trained, tested, we put our trust in, he passed his security clearance, or he got some kind of a clearance, you should trust in everything he does, everything he say. But I did work closely with Titan all year long while I was in Iraq, uh, and I can say that a lot of the, the translators weren't trained at all. I don't, I don't know what kind of training they received, but they were they were terrible at it. There was no managers, there was no supervision, there was no training, there was no follow-up. There was whatsoever a system of evaluation of what linguists are doing or how, what they're doing. Even a system of if these linguists really translating or doing or really are they translating or giving their opinion. Titan made the big bucks and hired the most incompetent people most of the time. Did not follow up with them, did not really know what they were doing. Probably as a result, a lot of people got hurt, a lot of people got killed, American lives got lost because someone wants to make money and wants to have a fat check in his pocket. the MPs who engaged and participated in, in horrific conduct are being held accountable for their actions. Why aren't the U.S. contractors, the civilian corporate personnel, why aren't they being held accountable for their actions? If you are a U.S. soldier and you hurt an Iraqi civilian and that becomes known, you will be court-martialed. But if you are a U.S. contractor and you kill an Iraqi civilian and that becomes known, you will be sent home. And then you can come back the following week and you can work for a different contractor. So here we have the two ringleaders of abuse at Abu Ghraib very explicitly saying in many cases what was happening was they were being ordered to abuse these detainees by civilian contractors. These guys are in prison for 18 years total between the two of them and there's no contractors in prison. Uh, my question is, regar is in regards to private military contractors. The Uniform Code of Military Justice does not apply to these contractors in Iraq. I asked your Secretary of Defense a couple months ago what law governs their actions. Uh, Mr. I was going to ask him. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Help. Well, I, was I was gonna, I'd pick up the phone and say, Mr. Secretary, I got an interesting question. 
This is what delegation, I don't mean to be dodging the question, although it's kind of convenient in this case, but never. <laughs> I really will. I, I'm going to call the secretary and say, you brought up a very valid question, and what are we doing about it? Because that's how I work. I'm, uh, um, thanks. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Are any of these allegations being investigated? There, uh, my recollection is, and I think it's okay to say this, is that the investigations are ongoing. Yes, sir. And that uh, time will tell. Somehow these contractors have leveraged power in Washington and the government feels like they want to protect these people. And they, they want to protect these, the security of these contracts and they want to protect uh, them from prosecution. Most of the managers and most of the the people we dealt with working for Titan were ex-military officers, high-ranking officers. All major military contractors have a board of directors and a senior management that is composed of senior retired military personnel. And this allows them to be able to go get contracts. Washington is a phenomenally incestuous place. Retired senior officers, Capitol Hill staffers, and defense industry. You know, the usual suspects come back again and again. Top recipients of money from Halliburton Titan, Cocky, and Blackwater are the two chairmen of the committees in Congress in the House of Representatives that oversee military matters and spending. The major corporations, these cartel and monopoly corporations, they've figured out how to legally buy influence. I would echo the words of Pope John Paul II, profit by itself is not a sufficient motivation for business endeavors. You're operating in the realm of greed. You're not operating in the realm of morality. I went to Iraq and I came back. What was so heartbreaking was that I found that we weren't, that we weren't always the good guys and it was very disillusioning for me because I'd grown up with this like dream of America, what America was. And when I saw that dream at Abu Ghraib and and what it had become, I felt heartbroken. I felt like I didn't know what it was to be an American because I saw what I had thought America was destroyed and disgraced. subsidiary of Halliburton, which is KBR, Kellogg, Brown and Root, was on the scene immediately. They were logistics people, they were mechanics, and they were also contracted to begin the process of setting up shower points, laundry facilities, mess halls, dining facilities, really searching for any opportunity to take on what would be traditionally military roles. When you use these contractors, you gain a lot of efficiencies. You gain a lot of expertise and, and, and specialization. It was devastating because they took over my job. I ended up doing nothing. We had to train these KBR contractors how to fix these radios. We had to walk them through all the basic steps. But when I could be actively becoming a better uh, soldier and being, becoming more proficient in my job, Instead, I'm going to sit up on guard duty to wait around while KBR contractors are 
doing the job that I had to train them to do. Across the board, people lost their job. Quartermaster companies, mechanic, any logistics soldiers were involved with, their jobs were outsourced to KBR. If you don't know KBR, you would have never been to Iraq. Because KBR is everywhere in Iraq. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of these trucks driving north and south on these roads every day, bringing supplies to other military bases. Most of the people who were driving for Kellogg, Brown, and Root were foreign workers. They were from Pakistan and uh, Nepal, India. Sometimes there would be Americans driving the trucks, U.S. civilians. I heard about the job through uh, another truck driver friend in Calexico, California. We were sitting there waiting for a load, and he told me this was his last load, and he was going overseas. From there, you know, I sent my resume in. I thought I was really going to be doing a lot of reconstruction in Iraq, uh, as far as, um, well, I could see me hauling fuel maybe to a, a, a place that had loaders and dozers, you know. We never went to go be in a battle or fight a fight. We went to take care of our families and make some money to reconstruct Iraq. Tony and I met in 79 at a Halloween party. It was kind of a blind meeting and uh, were married less than a year later. His brother was in the Navy and so he always wished that he had done something like that. But he's just a good old boy. He thought it was such a great cause to go and help rebuild and got a job with Halliburton and he was going to go drive a truck in Iraq. Within a month, he was there. I was uh, 15 when I met Steve, first time. And a good friend of ours introduced us at a fair they had, and uh, we set it up. He got out of the fiberglass business in Michigan and eventually ended up truck driving. Steve decided to go over there to get us financially set for not only retirement, but to, you know, help three kids go through college. He would take on anything if he thought that it would benefit his family. He wasn't military. He was non-combatant. He was a driver. He went over there to help rebuild Iraq. And that's what he wanted to do. When I woke up early that morning, it was about, I'd say about 4.30 a.m. We had to be out by our trucks at, by 7 a.m. And we already knew what we were going on on our mission. We were told at 7 p.m. the night before on the 8th of April. The first things we do was very normal. It was just routine behavior, just go ahead and do a pre-check, go ahead and uh, prevent a maintenance and check your oil and check your air in your tires and your fuel tank. And, the soldier that was sketching a map with his boot in the gravel next to his vehicle, well, it, some of us saw part of it and some of us didn't. And they never, nobody ever told us why, and nobody told us what was going on, and um, <clears throat> they said the roads were red, and I wasn't sure what red meant. We left the post uh, nearing 11 o'clock, 10.40. 11 o'clock in the morning in there somewhere and headed on our way to Baghdad. We're going down the road and, and we got pretty close to the, I believe the Abu Ghraibi prison and all of a sudden the traffic, there's no traffic. And uh, right about then, <clears throat> I mean bullets came from everywhere. It sounded like we were in a hailstorm. It was like when you were a a kid, we used to make popcorn in a pressure cooker. The temperature comes up and the, begins to pop. They were coming in through my doors. They were hitting my tanker. They were, they were hitting my windshield. They were coming into the, hitting the engine. You could 
hear them come in through one door, hit the other door when they lodged in, and I mean, they're just coming in everywhere. And then it just, it reached a crescendo and just seemed like it never stopped after that. And then I could hear the men uh, crying on the radio, yelling out for help. I'm burning, I'm burning, help me, help me. Please don't let me die in Iraq. Truck behind me, the, his trailer caught fire and he overturned and was trapped inside the truck and burned up. I heard one yelling and, and screaming and, and until he, he stopped. Friends that I'd promised before that, you know, they broke down or something happened, I wouldn't leave them. I hear them screaming, I'm hit, I'm hit. Help me, help me, please. I don't want to die here. I was completely saturated with blood, you know, and my pants were soaked with blood, my shirt was soaked from blood. It was just absolutely just sheer terror. Just absolutely, positively horrifying. And I still feel, I st still have that shaky sort of thing in me. It's like sitting here right now, it's like I'm, I'm still there. The mutilated bodies of four people were found west of Baghdad, near an area where a U.S. fuel convoy was attacked on Friday. After that attack, seven Americans were reported missing, including uh, contractors working for Halliburton, a company that supplies uh, fuel uh, and other supplies to U.S. troops. The families were notified today of the discovery. Halliburton did release a statement saying, quote, we at Halliburton are saddened to learn of these deaths and are working with authorities so the families can begin the grieving and healing process. Two U.S. soldiers are missing and also Thomas Hamill uh, from Macon, Mississippi. Saturday, April 10th, and one day after I got the first phone call from Halliburton and KBR, Steve, when you get back to base, please call me. I got a call yesterday saying that you are missing after heavy fighting and more attacks. You and nine others. Who's sharpening? And mm -hmm. what are these rocks called again? I forgot. Dad told us, but I don't remember. Like shale? I'm not sure. I just turned 50, and it's hard to have to, you know, reinvent yourself like you're a teenager again. Oh, no, your dreams go, plans go up, too. So, he was definitely below my life. He, he firmly believed that, that KBR and Halliburton were going to keep him safe. I mean, he, he truly did. He was very positive about that um, right up to the end. He believed he would be safe. He wasn't much of a writer, that's for sure. His journal's empty. <laughs> My dad had just told me he was going to work for Halliburton, and how big they were, and how they were there to help rebuild. Somebody knew that they sent these wonderful men out there. How can they do that? These men went to do the right thing. So, bottom line, they were totally taken advantage of. Well, I trusted the company. I trusted them. Now, this is a Fortune 500 company. I, I, I just don't believe they would send me down a road that was closed or was going to have hostile activity for sure. I just, that did, didn't even cross my mind. And U.S. forces here are saying openly they're braced for more terror attacks, more bombs. We had a significant anniversary, the fall of Baghdad. We had a Christian holiday, and they converged to create what was an obvious day of danger. Halliburton and KBR had news from multiple sources, including multiple sources in the military, that the roads that day were under active combat operations and were black, closed, and or red. No civilians. There were sitting ducks out there in a military, in military trucks on that day. They told us we couldn't wear camouflage or anything that made us look like military. The point was clear that we were not soldiers and we were not to behave like soldiers. 
he couldn't even wear a camouflage shirt <laughs> on base, let alone driving a military fuel truck out in, you know, the desert where there was a war around him. Why would they send this convoy in camouflage trucks down that road in the middle of battle? It's about contracts, I believe, fulfilling the contract and replacing us if we died. There's a lot of different contracts being offered out there, and, and Keller Brother really wants most of them. If they could have them all, they would take them all. And um, they wanted to continue doing business with the Army, whatever the risks were. It was nothing but the money. There's no duty, honor, country among anyone at Halliburton KBR. Halliburton KBR, some of these other firms over there are staying over there and continuing to make profits, big money, um, and people are just yeah, at the cost of human life. Their contract with the Army provided them literally billions of dollars of revenue every year, that the contract profit and the contract profit that they made became more important than the lives of the men that they hired. I think we're talking about what's right and the fact that you sacrificed our loved ones, our loved ones, for your profit. KBR, kill, bag, and replace people. They try to do it with us, and um, they killed my friends, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, they try to kill me. I know they know. This is a case about Halliburton and KBR trying to make a profit at time of war and using civilians in an improper fashion. Halliburton is in charge of seeing that these men and their employees are safe. Sent these men out on April 9th and knew, they knew that there was more than a good chance that they would be killed. When people talk about, oh, they, they gave their lives or this thing, and I, I can assure you that they did not. They were stolen from them. They were screaming and didn't want to go. And there wasn't anything greater, glorious about the whole obscene ordeal. They didn't die. They didn't pass away. They were murdered. KBR got billions of dollars worth of contracts in Iraq without a bidding. Halliburton got the government contract without competitive bidding. In the case of Halliburton, most of the contracts they've received have been sole source contracts, which means they're either given the contract, it's just offered to them, or they're the only people that bid on it. A lot of federal officials will defend this saying that this is the only company that can do the work. Conservatives, especially, who favor a free market system, should be outraged about the degenerate state, uh, the lack of competition in defense industry. Bunnantyne Greenhouse, a top contracting officer at the Army Corps of Engineers, alleges favoritism and rule breaking. I walked into a process that was corrupt, that was geared toward preferential treatment to KBR. KBR was pre-selected. The duration of the contract was predetermined. Most blatant abuse that I had experienced in my contracting career. The American way is competition. And I cannot sufficiently stress that in defense industry, when it comes to the big programs, there is not competition. It's monopoly and cartel behavior. It is corrupt. It is corrupting. It is corrosive to our national defense. When we showed up, there's nothing there. Our customer is a private coming off patrol who wants midnight chow, and we're there for him. We're doing stuff that you'll never read about in the paper. Everyone had to make a big adjustment over there. I helped with that. We got 80,000 troops out of the sand in three months. It was awesome. I'm Ian Dolan. Angela Stevens. Kirk Hampson. My name is Jay Patterson, and I'm proud to work for Halliburton. My name's Ben Carter, and within the first week of being in Iraq, I knew that that wasn't going to be the company that I wanted to be with. Halliburton was hired to provide clean, safe cooking, cleaning, shower water 
for the military. One of Halliburton's employees saw something wiggling in the water in his toilet bowl. So I went and tested the water in our water storage tanks. There was no chlorine in them, none. The water we showered in every single day was extremely contaminated. And when I talk about contaminated water, I'm saying malaria, typhus, uh, giardia, cryptosporidium. I mean, the list is really, really long. Halliburton is accused by its own employees of exposing troops to contaminated water in Iraq. And I tried to notify the troops that they may be exposed to a serious health risk. I was told that the military was none of my concern. They were only concerned with making their profit and didn't care how it may affect the troops. Of the 67 water treatment plants that Halliburton run, 63 of them weren't providing safe water. And the Marines are showering in it every single day. Sorry. I was there to help them. There's a lot of soldiers over there. They might come home without a bullet wound, but there's a lot of them that are gonna come home with pathogens in their blood because of Halliburton. And they don't even know to get tested for it uh, unless somebody tells them. And I'm sure Halliburton is not gonna be the company to tell them. When I joined Halliburton, I knew I was going to work on some big things. We put out a few fires at work. Once ran into a small challenge of getting some supplies to our troops. But the biggest thing? Serving our troops good old American food. So they feel just a little closer to home. How can you go to Chow Hall? How much time do you spend online? At least. At least. An hour. An hour. An hour for food? An hour, hour in the sandstorm for food. <laughs> Tell me about that line over there. What, what line am I looking at right now? That line is for the chow hall, where you eat. Several times, dining halls were attacked. All it takes is one Iraqi that's an insurgent, and because they knew what times we were going to eat every day, they knew when to expect to hit. And that happens because KBR won't go to a 24-hour feeding schedule where they just always have food ready. They won't do it because it saves them money. Because they get paid by how many soldiers they feed, not by how many soldiers they save. Feeding the troops. The Pentagon has found some serious problems with Halliburton's work on that contract as well. Pentagon auditors found that a Halliburton contract to provide food and housing for American troops had a staggering $1.8 billion in unsupported costs. It was all a scam. Halliburton was charging. $45 for a six pack can of like Coke or Pepsi that they give us and the military free in the mess hall. Now these sodas were made right there in the desert. It's not as if they were brought over from the United States. These sodas were made with Arabic wraps, you know, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, whatever, right there in the desert. So it's not as if they had an exorbitant transportation rate. They had the, the little mobile units that we had to put our clothes in like a net duffel bag. Halliburton charged the government $100 for every bag of clothes they washed. Whenever we got our laundry back, it felt worse than when we turned it in. Everything was still grimy. I stopped taking my laundry into KBR, and instead, I was washing it in the sink. And I was told by my chain of command that I was not allowed to wash my laundry on my own. I had to take it to KBR to have it washed, even though we all knew that they were doing a horrible job because they get $99 a bag for a bag of laundry that I could do at home for $3. It's a legal way of stealing from the government or taxpayers' money. The Pentagon audit released last night that found the company is overcharging taxpayers. Halliburton Company billed taxpayers for its contract work in Iraq. It is your money that's being used. These contracts are managed under a system called Cost Plus, which is the opposite 
of trying to save money. It guarantees that everything that you buy will be paid back and reimbursed if it's seen as justified, and you'll be given a profit in addition. A cost plus arrangement that critics say leaves little incentive to save. The more taxpayer dollars Halliburton spends, the more Halliburton makes. Cost Plus encourages you to run up the cost of the program because you are going to get a percentage of the, the end result. And so there's no incentive to stay at Motel 6. Stay at the Ritz-Carlton uh, in Qatar, folks. The place that they chose for orientation in Kuwait was a huge resort set right on the ocean. Had, I think, three swimming pools. So it was better than the Wyndham in Texas or the Ritz. It was fancied up. Marble floors, mahogany woodwork. It was just beautiful. They had sea dews, jet skis they could use. You could go and rent wave runners and go out and play in the water. We were renting wave runners, and we got paid by the hour to do it. I was told this, don't question it, enjoy it. Several government agencies are currently investigating if Halliburton overcharged for work already completed in Iraq. They had five-star meals catered in every day. It was so lavish. Rows of vegetable platters, beef platters, fish platters. It's a cost plus contract. KBR looked at it, the more money we spend, that's the more money we get in our pockets. We had it made over there compared to the military. I mean, those guys were living in tents, and we had air-conditioned private hooches. The tents that we were staying in were completely moldy, and everybody was getting sick with respiratory infections. They're getting paid millions of dollars. Why can't they even give us a tent that doesn't make us sick to live in it? The soldiers are sleeping on these little cots out in the middle of the desert. While these KBR executives are driving these $40,000 vehicles, they and their secretaries are driving at least a thirty to forty thousand dollar vehicle. This secretary lives in this complex, eats her meals in this complex, has her laundry delivered to her, has no reason to go anywhere at any time, but has a brand new top of the line Ford or Chevy pickup with everything imaginable on it that you could put on it. Chrome rims and leather interior and CD players and all these extra amenities that, you know, you don't really need in wartime. Why do they need an H-2 Hummer? Why do they have Cadillac Escalades in Iraq for Halliburton managers? What is the purpose? One invoice that I saw was for about $7,000 for one month for a SUV on a lease. It was a three-year contract comes up to uh, roughly $250,000. A vehicle that you and I could purchase at the local dealership for probably top of the line $45,000. And the taxpayer paid the same, $250,000. And never did own the vehicle. They got the wrong equipment, ordered the wrong stuff. Computers still in boxes, new vehicles. They'd push them out in what they call burn pits. And they just set it on fire, claim it as a loss, get more money for the right equipment or the right stuff they needed. Why would you need to order somebody else's wrong equipment just because somebody pays you to do it? And you burn it and destroy it. You got brand new trucks over there and there, there's not even oil filters. So when the motor blows, what do you do? Buy a new truck and build the government. $75,000 truck, they wouldn't even have a spare tire to fit it. And we had to blow it up. And they didn't care how the bird did because the government's paying for it. We knew that every day that a vehicle broke down, we would have to destroy it. And these are maybe $80,000 vehicles, maybe $100,000, you know, they're expensive trucks. We're burning fuel in front of Iraqi people. We're not really doing anything to help, and we just have to follow the orders. As a truck driver in the mail department, they'd send me to these camps with one bag of mail. And that's risking my life just to deliver one bag of mail. Escort entire convoys where every flatbed truck was empty. The allegation come from 12 truckers complaining that the company was wasting government money by running empty trucks on the convoy and billing the government for them. It seems senseless to travel up and down the road and taking a chance of losing your life when there wasn't no purpose in it. 
when you went up empty and you come back empty. The allegation I went to make a better life for my family. I always have a roof over their head and not have to worry about where their next meal's coming from. Because it wasn't that fun with him gone. We missed him and all that stuff. I couldn't do stuff with him. Didn't have anybody to throw a baseball with, did you? You had to go take you fishing. If your mom was scared you'd fall in and get drowned, it wouldn't she? Yeah. I went over there and I got my health messed up and got shot, bricked, knocked out, and everything else. I felt like not only I can make a decent living for my family and better myself, but I'll be doing something for my country, you know what I'm saying? I'm supplying the military and these guys where they can eat and help fight when we have to. But then, you know, you're looking and you're going up and down the road empty. Halliburton's charging the government for every camp they go by. And your buddy's getting killed for, un, for no cause at all. Not even as much as a Band-Aid on the truck. That's how Halliburton was making the killing, making their money. Is a legal way of stealing from the American citizen and the military. Halliburton is accused of hundreds of millions of dollars in improper charges. Pentagon auditors have found potential overcharges of $61 million. Now the numbers are apparently even larger than previously thought. Halliburton's unreasonable and unsupported bills exceed $1 billion. If anybody's overcharging the government, uh, we expect them to repay that money. It's been proven so many times that Halliburton has overbilled them. And then the Pentagon still pays them anyway. I don't know who it is that is protecting Halliburton. I don't understand why the military would protect them. If you look at their board of directors, they've got contacts in the State Department, contacts in the military. People who work for Halliburton once worked for the military. When you hire top Pentagon officials, when the vice president is your former CEO, you're going to get the access that other people don't. It is reportedly not a coincidence that Vice President Dick Cheney's old company got a huge contract to help rebuild Iraq. Time Magazine said it has gotten a hold of a Pentagon email saying Cheney's office coordinated Halliburton's multi-billion dollar deal. All the revelations came out about Halliburton getting all these fancy no-bid contracts. There was not a single hearing in the Congress, House or Senate, about the mysterious bidding processes around Iraq and Halliburton. Um, that's ridiculous. The oversight responsibility belongs to the United States Congress. It belongs here and it's not happening here. The Senate could spend a little less time advertising allegations of wrongdoing and spend more time talking about what is going right. If anybody believes that the contracts handed to Halliburton for Iraq weren't, you know, the moral equivalent of insider trading. Man, I, you know, I, I've got an ocean in the middle of Kansas I'd like to take you surfing on. Um, it's, it's just phenomenal. I mean, of course they were insider deals. Of course it was payback for, for old, old friends and political supporters and campaign contributors. They're very strategic uh, in how they allocate their political contributions. You'll see most of their money going to the committees that oversee military matters and funding for it. When you pay influence money in the form of campaign contributions, it means people look the other way. The U.S. Army announced today it signed a new contract with a unit of the huge contracting firm Halliburton. You know, the military fights for the guy next to you or the guy in the next foxhole who you've trained with, slept with, ate with, spent all your time living with and working with. From the corporate side, it's a question of where's the next contract coming from? Halliburton's stock has quadrupled in value since the war began, and taxpayers are being ripped off. The people in charge say, we want to give to contractors because they can do it cheaper. Well, lo and behold, the evidence is now coming in, and it isn't cheaper and we're not actually getting what we're paying for. We were writing contracts with Halliburton and others to do things 
the Iraqis could have done better and far, far cheaper. And by the way, we would have got Iraqis off the street and given them jobs. Let us stop the war profiteers. Let us say no to them. And let us say, if you continue to, you're going to go to jail because that's where you belong. My amendment would stop them. There hasn't been a single major piece of contracting oversight legislation passed by the Congress since the war began. Not even a significant amendment has been passed, despite all the enormous amounts of fraud and waste and abuse. There needs to be a special committee established, a bipartisan committee, to take a look at waste and fraud and abuse. The amendment is not agreed to. The amendment is not adopted and the Leahy Amendment is not agreed to. If I had the heads of khaki of Titan of KBR, let's say, what would Thomas Jefferson have to say? If he saw the level of profit that had been included in war fighting, what would Benjamin Franklin say? The government of the people, by the people, and for the people is really of, by, and for the companies that are getting the contracts. And that is not the American people. Raytheon, Parsons, and DHB are not America as I know it. Their greed goes against our grain. We have more and more money that are going out to these companies and less and less people watching the federal piggy bank. We need greater oversight in this war, even more than in past wars, because this war has been privatized to a greater extent than any other war in history. I voted for some of these people, okay? Let's see what happens. Let's see if anybody gets in trouble for this. Let's see how many people go to prison. Let's see who loses a contract over this. I know we have a battle ahead from Lockheed Martin to Dynacorp and Bechtel. The profiteers are not going to easily transform into patriots. The people who have the money, the people who are making a profit, have a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of influence. And so I think it will really take something big, a big movement here in the United States. You know, I love my country. I'd stand behind it. I'm concerned now in a way probably that I've never been concerned before because I don't like what I'm seeing. America's become a powder keg, I think. And it's just waiting for a match. This Iraqi movement, how are you gonna win the hearts and minds of these people? If they see you cheating your own people, if all this stuff is it's just for the money, before we can point the finger at anybody else, we need to get the center out of our own eye, and we need to clean house a little bit. I think the world really needs to know what's going on over there. There has to be accountability, and we need to stop it. I am a patriot. I love our country, and I want our country to survive. And the survival of our country depends on us taking it back.
Hi, can I have Tony Fredrickson's office? I was wondering if I could um, request an interview with Eric Prince. Recording. Uh, hi, Kathy Mann. It's Robert Greenwald and Amanda Spain calling from Los Angeles. We're working on the film A Rack for Sale. We want to get Mr. Fredrickson's perspective. Okay. We're really very anxious to have Halliburton and Mr. Lazar in the film. Uh, yes, Robert Greenwald and Abby Hurwitz here. We've discovered, frankly, quite a bit of very troubling material. I thought letting people know that we found something critical would be fairer than just kind of trying to sucker punch them about Halliburton KBR's role in the war and the war profiteering. We'll put the whole transcript from the interview up on our website. Hi, Angela. How are you? This is Abby Hurwitz. I left a message with Lindsay Taylor last Friday requesting an interview with Eric Prince, and I was wondering um, tomorrow. We really want to give you an opportunity to be heard. I know that it's been quite a bit of time and you have not responded. I was wondering if there was anyone in your organization that would like to be interviewed to represent your company. Can I get, can I get your email address? Okay. Can you please put me through to her? Oh, I thought she was going to be in all day. Remember early morning, late tonight? This is my third call to Titan. This is Robert Greenwald and Amanda Spain calling from Los Angeles. I think we talked to you yesterday. Permission to make a documentary? Uh, yes, Jody Brown. It's Robert Greenwald and Amanda Spain calling again. It's Wednesday, July 26th. Uh, we've been emailed five or six times. And that's to get a to get an interview with Mr. Fredrickson. I put in a request to have an interview with um, Eric Prince. We're just about at our deadline here. The reason why I keep calling is because we're kind of under some time constraints. I guess Kathy Mann's unavailable till Thursday, and you're going to, someone's going to try to reach Melissa Norcross. Eric Prince, he's not available. Hello, Mr. Prince. This is Robert Greenwald and Abby Hurwitz. I've emailed her like five or six times. The month of calling and emailing and talking has gotten us nothing. Jody Brown, it's Robert Greenwald and Amanda Spain calling again. Our film is going to wrap soon. We could interview Mr. Lazar tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, possibly even Friday. We still have time to interview Mr. London. We could do it in the next couple of days. Oh, okay. I got you. Is that just a way of saying you don't want to have anything to do with it? Because saying you can at this time over a period of a month just leads us to believe either you don't want to do it or there's something you don't want to say. We don't know what it is. Um, would you do me a favor for my, for my boss? Will you just write that to me? Will a day make a difference? Will a week, a month, a year, five years? Okay, so y'all, y'all are, y'all are saying no. So you are definitely going to turn it down. No. No. They said no. 